possibility of criminal activity. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Let the record indicate that the witness did have... Test one, two. Test one, two. One, two, one, two. Test one, two. Test one, two.
Good morning. The Judiciary Committee will come to order, and without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on examining the allegations of misconduct against IRS Commissioner John Koskinen, Part 1, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. The Constitution sets forth a system of checks and balances which grants each branch of government tools to ensure that no branch of government attains too much power. The legislative branch's tools include the power to write the laws, the power of the purse, the impeachment power, and the power to censure, among others. These tools empower Congress to exert oversight over the executive and judicial branches, including rooting out corruption, fraud, and abuse by government officials and taking further disciplinary action on behalf of the American people when warranted. The duty to serve as a check on the other branches, including against corruption and abuse is a solemn one, and Congress does not and must not take this responsibility lightly. That is why this committee has scheduled the hearing today. In 2013, the American people first learned that their own government had been singling out conservative groups for heightened review by the IRS as they applied for tax-exempt status. The, this IRS targeting scandal was nothing short of shocking. It was a political plan to silence the voices of groups representing millions of Americans. Conservative groups across the nation were impacted by this targeting, resulting in lengthy paperwork requirements, overly burdensome information requests, and long, unwarranted delays in their applications. In the wake of this scandal, then IRS official Lois Lerner stepped down from her position but questions remain about the scope of the abuses by the IRS. The allegations of misconduct against Koskinen are serious and include the following. On his watch, volumes of information crucial to the investigation into the IRS targeting scandal were destroyed. Before the tapes were destroyed, congressional demands, including subpoenas for information about the IRS targeting scandal went unanswered. Koskinen provided misleading testimony before the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee concerning IRS efforts to provide information to Congress. These are very serious allegations of misconduct, and this committee has taken these allegations seriously. Over the past several months, this committee has meticulously poured through thousands of pages of information produced by the investigation into this matter, resulting in this hearing today, which will give the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee the opportunity to formally present its findings and evidence to the members of this committee. We will hear from Representative Jason Chaffetz, the Chairman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, as well as Representative Ron DeSantis, Chairman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on National Security. <coughs> They will ha each have 10 minutes to discuss the evidence their committee investigation has uncovered. Chairman Chaffetz will also present a video regarding this matter. It is worth noting that Commissioner Koskinen was also invited to the hearing, but he has declined the invitation. Following the witness's testimony, each Judiciary Committee member will be allowed to ask the witnesses questions for five minutes. It's now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Goodlatte. Uh, before I begin my statement, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the statements of IRS Commissioner John Andrew Koskinen and the gentleman from Maryland, ranking member Elijah Cummings. I uh, reserve the right to object. The gentleman. I object. Wish to be recognized? I wish to be recognized. An objection is noted. Oh. If the gentleman, I, the gentleman I, would yield. The gentleman, of course. Uh, uh, point, of, point of inquiry related to my objection. Uh, the witness was invited to come and has uh, delivered us instead a self serving written statement while well, telling us in that statement he respect, res respects the committee, he's refusing to be here for his own impeachment inquiry. On what basis would we allow unsworn testimony uh, for what should have been a sworn witness under the penalty of perjury? May I? Of course. Gentlemen. May I tell Gentlemen. my colleague that, uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, the, the uh, 
gentleman uh, who is the subject of this, this is not an impeachment inquiry. I think you used that phrase, and that's incorrect. It's an inquiry into the recommendation for impeachment. No, it. Uh, the, the title of the hearing is Examining the Allegations of Misconduct Against IRS Commissioner John Koskinen, Part 1. And, and, I, and I appreciate that, but we, he is, in fact, the subject of a referral from another committee with specificity and was called as a witness uh, to have an opportunity under oath to clear that up. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, where would we normally accept from a witness who declined uh, an unsworn statement, one that uh, would not, would be self-serving. Uh, and, and to be candid, uh, Ranking Member Conyers, uh, this, is, this is sort of lowest learner revisited. The opportunity to say what you want to say and not be cross-examined so would seem to be inappropriate from a witness who has declined being here. Uh, obviously, you know, he can say whatever he wants and he will be at Ways and Means tomorrow saying what he wants to. The question this is an inquiry as onto allegations of his misconduct, and it is pursuant to a referral from another committee of a serious uh, referral, uh, one that never happened in Absolutely. my Absolutely. I don't, I don't quarrel with that whatsoever, uh, sir. All, all I'm saying is that uh, uh, he, he is not here. Was he? Wait, he, he was not given the customary two weeks' notice. He was just came back from China last week. Uh, but I'm not uh, uh, making excuses for his absence. All I'm saying is that since he is not here and he has a statement, uh, I'd, I'd like to put it in the record. And uh, if you think that that's uh, 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 something that he doesn't deserve, uh, I, I'm bound by your objection. Mr. Chairman, I would ask that if that uh, uh, opening statement be placed in the record to be placed with a provision alongside it for the record that A, he was invited, B, he declined, and C, that the, uh, the letter has to be taken as not, uh, not witness evidence and self-serving of his not being here. As long as we can agree to language that, that effectively makes it clear that this is a self-serving statement by somebody who chose not to be here while well, tomorrow will be in front of another committee. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with it being there, but I don't want it to be seen as an opening statement because uh, it, quite frankly, this written statement is not, uh, this should not have the same credibility. The gentleman has the right to object to the statement being made a part of the record. Uh, the gentleman uh, can ask unanimous consent uh, to withdraw his objection subject to uh, the uh, limitations that the gentleman just outlined regarding how the uh, uh, matter would appear in the record, but and, and I'm, I, that would itself be subject to. I uh, would ask unanimous uh, consent that the pairing be placed in so that this can be placed in the record at the <laughs> wishes of the ranking member. Uh, do, what, what purpose does the gentleman from Texas seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I object to the uh, unanimous consent that uh, uh, John Cossum's uh, statement be put in the record at all. However, the ranking member also asked unanimous consent to have the statement of Mr. Elijah Cummins in the record. I do not object to that being part of the record, only the statement of the IRS commissioner without any provisions as to what should be attached or not attached. I object to the entire statement. He had the chance to be here. He's not. The, the uh, uh, chair will ask if there is if there was an objection to the unanimous consent request of the gentleman from Michigan to place uh, 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 ranking member Cummings statement in the record being none there that will be made a part of the record uh, there is objection heard regarding placing the statement of Commissioner Koskinen in the record and therefore it will not be placed in the record uh, if there are further uh, discussions regarding under what conditions it might be made a part of the record the chair will be happy to entertain that any, any time in the course of the hearing but at this point objection is heard and it will not be made a part of the record gentleman may continue with his opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, in the history of our republic, the House of Representatives has voted to impeach a federal official only 19 times. 
I have the honor of having served on this committee to consider six of those 19 resolutions. And as a matter of note, I voted in favor of five of them. And I helped to draft articles of impeachment against then sitting President Richard Nixon and joined with 20 Democrats and six Republicans to send three of those articles to the House floor. The lessons I draw from these experiences uh, are hard earned. And to begin with, the power of impeachment is a solemn responsibility entrusted to the House of Representatives by the Constitution and to this committee by our peers. The formal impeachment process is not to be joined lightly. We do not rush into it for short-term political gain, I'm sure. Before we can approve any such resolution, it's our responsibility to prove the underlying allegations beyond a reasonable doubt. And, and I suspect that's why this hearing is titled the way it is and is moving in th that direction to examine the allegations of misconduct, which I think is, is not unfair. Now, it, it's our responsibility to prove underlying allegations uh, even of misconduct uh, with great seriousness and I think with uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And once the House authorizes us to do so, we must carefully and independently review the evidence even if it's already been analyzed by our colleagues on other committees. And we can only address allegations that are actually supported by the record. We cannot infer wrongdoing from the facts. We have to prove it. And finally, a successful process must transcend party lines. The framers of the Constitution knew this. Article one of the Constitution requires two-thirds of the Senate to convict on any article uh, suggesting impeachment. The many in the, pub, uh, many in the public knows this too. When this committee comes together and decides to examine or remove a federal officer, our constituents know that we take the job seriously. When a vote uh, such as this is divided on party lines, as it was on one occasion in my service on this committee, we undermine our credibility and make it all but impossible to secure conviction uh, in the Senate. Mr. Chairman, we're here today because uh, a group of members, a small group of members, want us to take up uh, House Resolution 494, a resolution to impeach IRS Commissioner John Koskinen. This re re resolution fails by every measure uh, that I have uh, learned of in the course of the uh, hearings in this vein uh, over the years. It arises, sad to say, from the worst partisan instincts. It is not based in the facts, and it has virtually no chance of success, in my view, in the Senate. Commissioner Koskinen, from what I can determine, is a good and decent civil service. He took months, took office months after the so-called targeting scandal had concluded. 
He then undertook a massive effort to respond to each of the investigations into the matter. We are here today to consider the allegation that the commissioner deliberately misled Congress as a part of those efforts. The claim is not that we disagree with his decisions or that we question the speed and completeness with which his agency provided answers, but that he knowingly and intentionally supplied us with false information. Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, the record simply does not support this charge. The Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration investigated these allegations. He concluded, and I quote, no evidence was uncovered that any IRS employees had been directed to destroy or hide information from Congress, the Department of Justice, or the Inspector General, in quotation marks. In addition, career investigators at the Department of Justice also looked into these claims. They also found, and I quote again, no evidence that any official involved in the handling of the tax-exempt applications or IRS leadership attempted to obstruct justice, in quotation. It's no wonder, then, that we have read reports of Speaker Ryan doing his best to make certain this measure never reaches the floor of the House as Speaker Boehner did before him. It's also not a surprise that many in the Republican conference have been critical of the tactics that forced this hearing. Representative Bustany, chairman for the Subcommittee on Tax Policy, has argued that this hearing is a waste of time and potentially damaging to our priorities. He told reporters last week, if we do this, it's going to further delay the investigation. I think it's time to move on, in quotation. Senator Orrin Hatch, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, has said that there is simply no interest in an impeachment activity in the United States Senate, where a two-thirds vote would be required for any conviction. When asked about Commissioner Koskinen, Senator Hatch said we have a very different experience with him. We can have our disagreements with him, but that doesn't mean that there's an impeachable offense. And he added, for the most part, he's been very cooperative with us. To summarize, Mr. Chairman, the proposed articles have been debunked, uh, the, the investigation itself, by independent investigators. The resolution faces stiff bipartisan opposition in the House and even worse odds in the United States Senate. There are precious few working days left in this Congress. I am personally disappointed that we plan to spend not just today, but an additional day in June discussing these unsubstantiated claims. If it's at all possible, Chairman Goodlatte, please consider returning the second day to the substantive work of this committee. In any event, I urge you to lead us past this distraction quickly and back to the work of some actual benefit to the American people. And I thank you for the time, and I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Without objection, all other members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. We welcome our distinguished witnesses today, both of whom are members of the House Judiciary Committee. But as is our custom, if you would both please rise, we'll begin by swearing you in. Do you and each of you swear that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you very much. 
Please be seated and let the record reflect that both witnesses responded in the affirmative. I will now begin by introducing today's witnesses. The first witness is the Honorable Jason Chaffetz. Representative Chaffetz has been a member of the House Judiciary Committee since first coming to Congress in 2009. Representing the 3rd District of Utah, he is a member of the Judiciary Subcommittee on Courts, Intellectual Property, and the Internet, and the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, Homeland Security, and Investigations. Since 2015, Mr. Chaffetz has served as Chairman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Our next witness is the Honorable Ron DeSantis. Since being elected to the U.S. House in 2012, Representative DeSantis has served on the Judiciary, <coughs> Foreign Affairs, and Oversight and Government Reform Committee. He is currently the Chairman of the Oversight Committee's National Security Subcommittee and the Vice Chairman of the Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on the Constitution and Civil Justice. Welcome to you both. Your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety, and I ask that each of you summarize your testimony in the time that you are allotted. To help you stay within that time, there is a timing light on your table. You guys know how this works. <laughs> when the light turns red, it signals that your time has expired, but uh, given uh, the uh, uh, importance of this, we have allotted uh, additional time to each of you and for the video that uh, the Chairman has brought with him as well. We'll begin with Chairman Chaffetz. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I appreciate uh, your holding this hearing and your indulgence. And, and to the Ranking Member Conyers, I enjoy a good working relationship with you, and uh, I enjoy your friendship, and I expect that to, con to continue in the future, and, and I appreciate the discussion today. I also want to note and thank uh, Chairman Issa, who was the chairman of the Oversight Committee when much of this work was happening, many of these hearings were happening, and through his good uh, work and tenacious uh, approach to this, uh, it was an important step and it wouldn't be here today, quite frankly, without the good work and leadership of, of uh, Daryl Issa. Uh, this is really a, a simple case in my mind. When Congress asks you a question, you're expected to give a truthful answer. And when Congress issues a subpoena, Compliance is not optional. Imagine if a taxpayer fail, failed to comply with an IRS summons or subpoena. What would they do to you? If they ask you for those materials, you're expected to produce those materials. And if you don't, they're going to take you to court and they're probably, gonna, probably going to win. The IRS targeting scandal was un-American. The IRS is the most powerful and feared entity in the United States. The First Amendment rights of citizens were trampled upon. Now, in fairness, Mr. Koskinen, as the commissioner of the IRS, was not there for the initial targeting. He was brought in by President Obama as a turnaround artist, somebody who would work hand in hand with Congress to fix the problem. From my perspective, he didn't fix the problem. He made it worse. There have been numerous hearings, letters, and subpoenas issued by a variety of, of committees. Now, the IRS is no stranger to a summons or a subpoena. They know exactly how this works. In fact, on average, they issue about 66,000 summons and subpoenas per year, and they have since 2010. Failure to obey an IRS summons is a criminal violation under 26 U.S.C. Section 7210 and carries with it a fine up to $1,000 and a year in, of imprisonment. If you don't comply, the IRS is going to come after you. They do prosecute. The IRS prevailed in 95% of those cases. Again, compliance with the subpoena is not optional. Providing false testimony before Congress comes with a consequence. At least it should. It's a crime. Mr. Koskinen did not tell the truth to Congress. He provided false testimony and failed to comply with the subpoena. He could have prevented evidence from being destroyed, but he didn't, and he didn't tell the truth about it. Americans are rightfully frustrated about the targeting scandal and the lack of accountability. But the case before us is about Mr. Koskinen and what he did and did not do, which permanently deprived the American people for, of understanding what went wrong with their government. It also prevents us, Congress, from fully fixing the problem and holding people accountable. And there can't be full accountability because the evidence was destroyed on Mr. Koskinen's watch and under a subpoena. The remedy given to us in the Constitution is impeachment. It is a remedy designed for Congress as a co-equal voice. The Senate gives its advice and consent on confirming presidential appointments. But our founders in that Constitution also gave us an opportunity to remove somebody if they're not serving the best interest of the United States of America. The Senate has the opportunity to have a co-equal voice on who serves in the upper echelons of government, and the safety valve to pull somebody out of there for Congress is impeachment. 
hasn't been done off, often enough, and I think we must stand up for ourselves. Now, get, give some background. I'm going to show a video. It's about 10 minutes, and then we'll get into the very specifics of where I think Mr. Koskin and lied. From the woman at the center of the IRS scandal. Scandal involving IRS targeting of conservative groups. Where's and Lois Lerner? Lois Lerner. Targeting conservative groups. Lois Lerner. That's when Lois Lerner's... This was orchestrated. It was planned. The possibility of criminal activity. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Let the record indicate that the witness did answer in the affirmative. On the advice of my counsel, I respectfully exercise my Fifth Amendment right and decline to answer that question. The IRS and Lois Lerner, something we've only received over the years in bits and pieces. But what does it look like all pieced together? Let's rewind. In 2013, the IRS admitted to the selective intentional targeting of American taxpayers based on their political beliefs. This is Lois Lerner. She was the IRS employee with the most knowledge of the intentional targeting. But when called to testify, she refused. With the key witness unwilling to cooperate, to get to the truth, Congress had to obtain and review documents. What followed was a sequence of obfuscation, obstruction, and destruction of evidence by the IRS, which has left the American people with no real answers to why their First Amendment rights were violated. With rumors of targeting percolating, in June 2011, Ways and Means Chairman Dave Camp sends the first letter to the IRS related to the allegations of the IRS's mistreatment of conservative groups. Nine months later, in March 2012, Chairman Daryl Issa and Jim Jordan of the House Oversight Committee send a letter to the IRS requesting information. By May 2013, the IRS admits to targeting and Chairman Issa and Jordan send yet another letter to the IRS requesting information. The President acknowledges wrongdoing and pledges cooperation. It's inexcusable and Americans have a right to be angry about it. Our administration has to make sure that we are working hand in hand with Congress to get this thing fixed. By August, the Oversight Committee issues its first subpoena and the committee sends a letter to the Treasury Secretary reminding him of the obligation to preserve all emails. At this point, three congressional committees, the Inspector General, and the DOJ all have investigations underway. Fast forward nine months. After he condemned the targeting, President Obama states in a February 2014 interview that there is not a smidgen of corruption. Not even mass corruption, not even a smidgen of corruption. But all these investigations are still open. Even the investigation he ordered was not complete. So how did the president arrive at this conclusion? What did he become aware of in those nine months? Meanwhile, IRS Commissioner Koskinen appears before multiple congressional panels, promising to deliver all of Lois Lerner's emails. Are you going to provide the documents for Lois Lerner? Yes. That were subpoenaed? Yes. We're working very hard to get you the Lois Lerner emails. If are you or are you not going to provide this committee all of Lois Lerner's emails? We are already yes, starting to process. Yes, we will do that. Until he starts backtracking and obfuscating and parsing. Process, we'll redact them. There's going to be thousands of pages, but it's not going to expedite the conclusion of this uh, investigation. And then in June 2014, he tells Congress that Lerner's emails could not be recovered. As the actual hard drive after it was determined that it was dysfunctional and that with experts, no emails could be retrieved, was recycled and destroyed in the normal process. This was. So was it physically destroyed? Uh, that's my understanding. So what could have possibly happened for the commissioner to make such a statement? Remember that very first letter from Chairman Camp to the IRS in June 2011? Well, coincidentally, Lois Lerner's hard drive crashes just eight days later. What are the odds? Her hard drive crashing within a week of an inquiry from Congress truly defies all odds. This hard drive will sit in a bin for nearly eight months until it is destroyed, within weeks of an IRS internal investigation commencing. Another coincidence. In April 2013, a month before admitting to the targeting, Lois Lerner reminds colleagues to be cautious about what we say in emails, and on that same day asks whether the internal instant messaging system is archived. When told no, Lerner responds, perfect. So back to May 2013, the IRS just admitted to targeting and the president just promised cooperation. Lois Lerner comes before Congress and takes the fifth, and on the exact same day, Nearly two years after Congress started asking questions. 
the IRS finally issues a non-destruct order to all IRS personnel. So with an admission of targeting, subpoenas, and investigations underway, we return to the President's peculiar comments from February 2014. Not even a smidgen of corruption. Well, on the same day the President makes those comments, the IRS discovers a problem, a gap in Lois Lerner's emails. Thousands of emails are missing from around the critical period in the targeting in 2011. Remember, her hard drive crashed. Staff recognizes the need to collect backup tapes that might contain emails from the relevant time frame. Good thing for that non-destruct order and a subpoena from Congress ordering the preservation of documents. But on March 4th, 2014, 422 backup tapes containing emails from the relevant time frame are destroyed. This is 30 days after realizing there's a gap and eight months after the non-destruct order and the subpoena. How does something like this happen? The IG testifies that it's truly an unbelievable set of circumstances. How in the world, with the preservation order and a subpoena, do they destroy 422 tapes? It, it's an unbelievable set of circumstances that would allow that to happen. And wasn't Commissioner Koskinen appearing before Congress at this same time, assuring members that the IRS would turn over all emails? Did the commissioner intentionally mislead Congress? Testimony suggests that the IRS knew that Lois Lerner's emails had been destroyed at the time of the commissioner's March testimony. Remember all the open investigations. Besides Congress and the DOJ, the IG was also investigating varying aspects of the targeting scandal. They started looking into Lois Lerner's emails in June 2014. Here's their story. In June 2014, the IG opens its investigations into the missing Lois Lerner emails. Commissioner Koskinen confirms that Lois Lerner's emails cannot be recovered and describes the great lengths the IRS has gone trying to find them. We spent, as I noted, at last count, uh, uh, $18 million uh, responding. We've had over 250 employees at various times involved. We've had over 100 or 120,000 hours of effort devoted to it. And as I said, we've gone to great lengths. We've re retraced the process for producing your email twice just to make sure that no email was missing. We understand the importance of this investigation. We've gone to great lengths, spent a significant amount of money trying to make sure that there is no email that is required that has not been produced. They didn't find any. Meanwhile, the IG is looking for backup tapes. Just 15 days into their investigation, the IG drives one and a half hours from D.C. to an IRS facility in West Virginia and asks for backup tapes used to back up Lois Lerner's email account. They are handed 744 tapes. It's identified the 744 backup tapes that met this criterion, and TIGDA took possession of all of the identified 744 backup tapes. Attendants at the facility said no one ever asked them for the tapes, but that they've been there all along. IRS in testimony and letters stated that it left, and I quote, no stone unturned, end quote, to recover the emails. Was that true? And we were able to recover emails. So it would appear that that statement is that a statement statement. was not true. July 2014, IRS officials testified that it, quote, confirmed the emails were unrecoverable, end quote. Given that recoverable data still existed on the tapes, was that statement true? It would not appear to be true. It would not appear to be true. And I quote, no way, end quote, to recover them. Was that true? That would not appear to be true. That would not appear to be true. We have established here today multiple uh, incidents where the IRS did not tell the truth. Throughout the course of their investigation, which went into the summer of 2015, the IG recovers 1,000 unique emails that were never turned over by the IRS. But what did they do with these emails? To the best we can determine through the investigation, they just didn't, simply didn't look for those. So for the 1,000, over 1,000 emails that we found on the backup tapes, we found them because we looked for them. They had them. They were under subpoena. What a coincidence. Remember those 422 tapes that were destroyed after the IRS knew they were missing emails and after the non-destruct order was in place and eight months after the subpoena? If those had been properly preserved, an additional 24,000 emails may have been recovered and maybe there would be answers. But the American people will never know because the IRS didn't do its job of preserving the information the way it was obligated to do. The IG also concluded in its investigation that the IRS neglected to search sources beyond Lois Lerner's hard drive for emails. Uh, how many potential sources for recovering Ms. Lerner's emails existed uh, for the IRS? We believe there were six. The hard drive would have been a source, BlackBerry, backup tapes, 
server drives, the backup tapes for the server drives, and then finally the loaner laptops. How many of these six did the IRS search? We're not aware that they, they searched anyone in particular. They didn't look for backup tapes. They didn't look at her BlackBerry. They didn't look at the server, or backup server, or the loaner laptop. So what great lengths did they really go to? On the advice of my counsel, I respectfully exercise my Fifth Amendment right and decline to answer that question. The bottom line, IRS didn't fulfill its legal obligation to respond to Congress. They didn't preserve information. They didn't try to find the information. They misled Congress for years. Their failings leave the American people in the dark about how their First Amendment rights were trampled upon. There must be accountability. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing us to show that video. I want to drill down a little bit further on Mr. Koskinen's testimony to Congress, especially some of the statements made uh, to Congress on, in June and July of the year 2014. When he came to explain why the IRS wouldn't be able to produce thousands of lowest learners' emails, at that point a subpoena had been in place since August of 2013. The subpoena was reissued to Mr. Koskinen after he was confirmed, so by then the subpoena had had his name on it for more than five months. On February 2, 2014, Super Bowl Sunday, Kate Duvall realized that there was a problem with Ms. Lerner's emails and that some of them were missing from the IRS production to Congress. Ms. Duvall was counsel, counsel to the commissioner at the time, and she was basically managing the IRS production to Congress. The next day, on February 3rd, Ms. Duvall told her colleagues at the IRS about the problem she had found. She told the IT people. She talked to the people in the office of chief counsel. She talked to the Deputy Associate Chief Counsel, Thomas Kane, and by the next day, February 4th, Thomas Kane had figured out that Lois Lerner's hard drive had crashed back in 2011, and that that was why many of her emails were missing. So the IRS knew in early February that there was a problem with Ms. Lerner's emails, and Mr. Koskinen testified that he knew in February. This is his quote on a July 23rd, 2014 hearing, quote, what I was advised and knew in February was that when you look at the emails that had already been provided to the committee and other investigations, and instead of looking them by search terms, looked at them by date, it was clear that there were fewer emails in the period through 2011 and subsequently. And there was also, I was told, there had been a problem with Ms. Lerner's computer. So the question is, what did Mr. Koskinen under subpoena do about it? After all, he had this subpoena, he had just learned that most crucial evidence covered by the subpoena was missing, and so you'd expect him to spring into action. Well, let's start with what he did not do. According to the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, he failed to look in five of the six places Ms. Lerner's emails could have existed. The backup tapes, her BlackBerry, the server, the backup server, and the, the uh, loaner uh, laptop. In fact, the IRS barely looked for this missing emails at all, according to TIGDA. Now let's talk about what Mr. Koskinen did do. In April, his agency notified the Treasury Department and the White House that Ms. Lerner's emails were missing. And then he waited. And then he waited some more, until June, when the IRS finally told Congress by burying a couple of sentences in the fifth page of an attachment in a letter to the Senate Finance Committee. That was on June 13, 2014. That triggered a, fury, a, a, a flurry of hearings in Congress, and Mr. Koskinen came up to testify to explain what he said, and then he lied. We've got uh, three quotes here I want to share with you, among many, but let's look at what he told us on June 20th in 2014. Seven days after finally telling Congress that Ms. Lerner's emails were missing, he said, since the start of the investigation, every email has been preserved, nothing has been lost, nothing has been destroyed. That's not true. The investigation began in May of 2012. The Inspector General found the IRS destroyed, destroyed evidence, 422 backup tapes that contained as many as 24,000 emails to and from Ms. Lerner, and that happened on March 4th of 2014, which was discovered after, after they discovered there was a problem. Let me go to the second quote if I could. This is on the same day, June 20th, 2014, Mr. Koskinen testified before Congress, quote, we confirmed that backup tapes from 2011 no longer existed, end quote. That wasn't true either. 
The backup tapes were intact until March 4th of 2014, almost two years after the congressional investigations began and nearly one month after the IRS knew there was a problem with Lois Lerner's emails. At best, this is gross negligence. We go to the third quote. To me, this is one of the most troubling. This is July 23rd, another full month afterwards. July 23rd of 2014, he was asked what was meant by the word confirmed. He said, confirmed means that somebody went back and looked and made sure that, in fact, any backup tapes that had existed had been recycled, end quote. That was completely and totally false. Nobody at the IRS went back and confirmed that the tapes had been destroyed. The inspector general interviewed the people who were responsible, and they said that nobody had ever asked for the backup tapes. In fact, all told, the inspector general, it took them 15 days start to finish to go find these, and they did recover 1,000 emails. Thanks. You can take that down. If, if they had done so after learning that some of the learners' emails were missing in early February, they could have found the backup tapes before they were destroyed. We know this because, it, again, the inspector general only took them 15 days. Tim Camus, the deputy in inspector for investigations at TIGDA, Summer, summed it up by testifying, quote, the best we can determine through the investigation, they just simply didn't look for those emails. So for the thousand, over a thousand emails we found on the backup tapes, we found them because we looked for them, end quote. We're here today because Mr. Koskin had provided false testimony. He failed to comply with a duly issued subpoena. And when he knew there was a problem, he failed to properly inform Congress in a timely manner. In fact, I would argue that he actively misled Congress. Nor has Mr. Koskinen ever made an attempt to clarify or amend any of his prior statements. He continues to stand by all of these statements. They are not true. Look at the testimony that wasn't in entered into the record. Sentence three of the testimony that, that he put forward or tried to put forward here says, I stand by ready to cooperate with your committee with regard to any actions it deems appropriate. But I noticed that he didn't show up at the hearing here today, even though he was invited. And for him to say, Later, on page four, I testified truthfully and to the best of my knowledge in answering questions concerning the search for and production of emails related to the investigation, he still doesn't get it because that's not true. Mr. Chairman, regular the order. The gentleman. Regular order, sir. The gentleman. I, that was right. my concluding comment. Thank you. The chair thanks the chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee and uh, is now pleased to recognize and welcome uh, Congressman DeSantis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Conyers, my colleagues on the committee. Although I didn't know it at the time, the first exposure I had to the R IRS targeting scandal occurred long before that day in May 2013 when Lois Lerner publicly revealed the existence of improper targeting by the IRS. That she did this by infamously planning a question at a legal conference in order to preempt the forthcoming IG report was a clear indication that the IRS had improperly treated American citizens who were doing nothing more than seeking to exercise their First Amendment rights. Once this news broke, I immediately thought back to the previous year. I was not a member of this body. I was running for office for the first time, and as customary in campaigns, I made a, spe a point to speak to as many groups as I could find. In one instance, the leaders of one group, dedicated to educating their fellow Americans on the virtues of constitutional government, grew apprehensive when I showed up and requested to speak. As a candidate for office, they explained my speaking before the group could cause them problems with the IRS, an agency that they felt had mistreated their group by refusing to grant them tax-exempt status. I was in disbelief. It seemed to me that these folks were being paranoid. Why would the IRS care about a small group seeking tax-exempt status? Turned out my reaction was wrong, and there was good reason to be concerned about the behavior of the IRS, and I've always thought about that uh, as we've done this investigation. As a member of the Oversight Committee, I joined my colleagues in seeking to ascertain the truth about the conduct of the IRS and its employees like Lo Lois Lerner. Chairman Chaffetz has done a good job outlining the extent to which the IRS, under Commissioner Koskinen, has stonewalled and obstructed attempts by Congress to find out the truth about the conduct of the IRS. Koskinen pledged to be transparent and to alert Congress and the American people about problems with the investigation as soon as he knew about them, yet he failed to alert the Congress about the gap discovered in Lerner's emails for four months. Koskinen testified that every email had been preserved since the start of the investigation, yet the IRS destroyed over 400 backup tapes containing as many as 24,000 of Lois Lerner's emails in March of 2014. These emails, of course, were the subject of an internal preservation order and two congressional subpoenas. 
Koskinen testified that the backup tapes from 2011 had been recycled pursuant to normal IRS policy, yet the 400 backup tapes weren't destroyed until March of 2014. Moreover, the Inspector General was able, by doing a cursory investigation, to identify some backup tapes that had not been recycled. Koskinen testified that the IRS had gone to great lengths to make sure that all emails were produced, but as the chairman pointed out, it failed to even look at Learner's mobile device, the email server, backup server, loaner laptop, and IRS backup tapes, all of which were examined by the Inspector General. So in this matter, there's really no dispute about the facts. The IRS destroyed up to 24,000 of Lois Learner's emails under two subpoenas. Commissioner Koskinen made several statements and testimony for Congress that are false. And the IRS failed to produce all of the emails it had in its possession, as well as failing to do basic due diligence by not looking in obvious places for learners' emails. This is cut and dry. So this sorry train of false statements and dereliction of duty represents an affront to the authority of this House. The American people had a right to get the facts regarding the IRS targeting. And the IRS had a duty to comply with the congressional investigation. Instead, the IRS stonewalled. As thousands of emails have been destroyed, the American people may very well never get the entire truth as it relates to this scandal. Now, it would be unthinkable for a taxpayer to treat an IRS audit the way the IRS has treated the congressional investigation. If a taxpayer destroyed documents subject to a summons by the IRS, the taxpayer would be in a world of hurt. If a taxpayer made false statements to the IRS in response to an investigation, it's safe to say that the taxpayer would not get away with it. If a taxpayer shirked basic compliance with an IRS investigation, it's a good bet that the investigation would not simply end. So the question is, is it acceptable for the head of one of the most powerful agencies in government to operate under a lower standard of conduct than that which is applied to the taxpayers the commissioner is charged with auditing? I have no doubt that American taxpayers find such an arrangement to be unacceptable. Surely this House should also find it unacceptable. As of today, not a single individual has been held accountable in any way for what happened with the IRS. If Commissioner Koskinen get away with this conduct, then other executive branch agencies will have a blueprint of how to stymie the Congress when it conducts legitimate oversight. This will further erode the power of the Congress, which is arguably at its historical nadir. The Constitution contains mechanisms for self-defense that can be used to check abuses by civil officers in the executive branch. We in this body should use them. It's a matter of fairness for the American people, accountability for the executive branch, and self-respect for this institution. I thank the chairman for the time. <coughs> Chair, thanks, gentlemen. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions for witnesses, and I'll begin by recognizing myself. The report of the investigation by the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, or TIGTA, <coughs> concluded in its 2015 report as follows, and I quote, the investigation revealed that the backup tapes were destroyed as a result of IRS management failing to ensure that a May 22, 2013 email directive from IRS Chief Technology Officer concerning the preservation of electronic email media was fully understood and followed by all of the IRS employees responsible for handling and disposing of email backup media, end quote. Now, my understanding is that Commissioner Koskinen was brought in, appointed commissioner, for the purpose of uh, restoring the credibility of the IRS following this horrific scandal. Uh, and that uh, part of restoring that credibility would be coming clean, making sure that the investigations conducted by various committees here in the House of Representatives uh, were responded to appropriately with the information that they requested. And that in doing so, one would follow all the chains of evidence within one's organization that he's now the head of uh, to uh, find where that might go. Uh, and then send people there and say, what do you have? Because according to the evidence that you brought forward today, that was never done. So I would like to hear from each of you your understanding to what extent Commissioner Koskinen is responsible for the management of the IRS and for this management failure? Um, thank you. Um, he has a duty and obligation, a legal obligation, under a subpoena to comply with that subpoena and do everything he can in his power to make sure that he's doing that. He testified in multiple committees and multiple times, in addition to, I believe, letters, saying that he was making every effort, that he had spent $18 million <coughs> 
that they did had. You ever, did you ever break that down for you? Did you ever see, I, I, I saw those statements uh, as part of the video. Did he ever say, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and we spent this money for this, and this, and this? We, we can find, nor can TIGDA, based on the report, find no proactive evidence that the commissioner uh, did anything proactively to actually uh, recover those tapes from the source of which they were destroyed. It took the inspector, I guess the comparison is the inspector general. The inspector general took him start to finish 15 days to go find him. And the commissioner had years and millions of dollars of resource and didn't even ask for the basic, at the basic sources. What, what really does it for me is um, you have these backup tapes in West Virginia and the inspector general testified about what he did. He got in his car and he drove to West Virginia and he asked for the backup tapes. So when you start talking about spending $18 million, what does it cost to, for gas to get to West Virginia and back? 50 bucks, 60 bucks? And he goes there, he is able to recover some of the tapes. Now, of course, others were destroyed. Uh, but the people at the tape, backup tape facility said the IRS never even requested any of the backup tapes. And so um, I think that that says a lot about his leadership, and I think it shows, it undercuts his claim that they went to great lengths to get the information. And very specifically, with regard to that very facility, uh, to further re uh, a quote from the TIGTA report, although they existed until March 4, 2014, the backup tapes containing learners' emails were destroyed because IRS employees who shipped the backup tapes and server hard drives did not understand their responsibility to comply with the Chief Technology Officer's May 2013 email directive to preserve electronic backup media, and the Martinsburg employees who destroyed the backup tapes on March 4, 2014 misinterpreted the directive. As you understand it, who was responsible for making sure IRS employees understood that May 2013 directive? The Commissioner of the IRS. That's who we issued the subpoena to. Mr. DeSantis? I concur. Thank you very much, both of you. I now recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, for his questions. Uh, may I uh, thank my two colleagues for their testimony and uh, their concern about this matter? Uh, but uh, is there any way, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, that we could uh, determine uh, who was on the, the tape that you asked and received uh, consent to play for 10 minutes? I'm sorry, the question is who was on the tape? Yeah, who, who, was, who was the, the uh, woman on the, on the tape that was interpreting it? Can you tell us anything about the Oh, she was a staff team? member for the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. You mean the voiceover? Yes. Yes. She was a, a staff person for our, the Oversight Committee. Mm hmm Well, uh, I, I didn't know that before just now, and I, I'm sorry I didn't uh, I don't want to raise any more objections than have already been raised here this morning, but uh, it seemed a little bit unusual that this was a tape that you didn't identify who it was before it started playing. So what I'm what I'm concerned with is: are, are we talking about a uh, issues uh, in, in IRS, which is under usual the usual criticism, and in un, and in these recent circumstances, even more than the normal criticism that they they usually receive. Uh, are are we talking about uh, we don't like the way they're doing business? Uh, and we think that they made some mistakes and that they may have made even misstatements uh, or the, the present commissioner uh, ha have made statements that should be, uh, we should be uh, questioning or challenging as we normally do in this committee. And that seems to me to be 
the gist of the, the comments that I've received from my two learned colleagues on the committee that have testified here today. We don't like what happened. Uh, can, can I, can I? Sure. Put some color on that a little bit? Please do. It, the first part is important to understand the context of why these emails are so important because the targeting of Americans, it's the suppression of their First Amendment rights is something I know on a bipartisan way we take very seriously. The facts before us on the impeachment go solely to what Mr. Koskinen did and did not do when he was under subpoena. And he provided, uh, he, he, there was a lot of gross negligence. There were things that he should have done that he, that he could have done. Um, but he also- But is, is gross negligence an impeachable offense? I think that is part of it, yes. Yes, I do. In fact, in 1974, the House Judiciary Committee came up with a report and it talked about um, the standard by which uh, an impeachable offense should be held, and I happen to concur with that. Well, I, I may, too, I haven't recalled it, but I was there uh, for that, and- uh, it, You're the only one. <laughs> that's right, and I, I want to make- I was seven, I was playing soccer. Uh -huh. Well, y your excuse for <laughs> not, not knowing about it until much later, <laughs> but but the whole idea of a, of a one uh, that 19 impeachment hearings have been held in uh, the almost a couple hundred years <coughs> is this being a little heavy-handed about the, this matter? I mean, I I probably disagree with some of the IRS commissioners' uh, views and conduct themselves, but uh, we're examining the allegations of misconduct against the IRS commissioner. And I, I feel that uh, if, if we're talking about another, another hearing on this same subject, uh, it, it seems to me uh, a little bit overbroad, and I I think that we sh we we ought to move a little bit uh, more carefully on this. I'm I'm going to have to examine all of the statements made here today, and uh, can, can and and it seems to me that we we really ought to uh, to move. With, with a little more discussion. There, there have been statements of hearsay, uh, of, uh, of uh, allegations that whether they're proved or, un or whether they're provable or not, I, I just don't know and I'm trying to find out. And, and of course, I, I give you the benefit of doubt because of your uh, passion and the great work you've done on it since you were seven. Uh, uh, in this area, do you do you see what what I'm I, I describing? Can, I, can, I can understand and respect that we may disagree on the remedy, but I think what we would find is that in fact we were lied to in Congress, we were misled in Congress, that there was gross negligence, that there was a duty and obligation, that the IRS, as much as anybody, when they issue sixty thousand subpoenas and summons per year, they know how this works. And um, that I think we can come yeah. to an agreement to. Well, I, I agree with you that we ought to look at these much more carefully, but it, it's sort of hard uh, at, at this point for me to a accept them or say that they're probably right or uh, that mistakes were made, and I'm sure that they were made, but uh, there, there seems there, there seems to be a, a, a anti IRS commissioner uh, environment here that makes it very difficult for me to to go forward without an investigation of all that's been said this morning, and I I thank the gentleman. Thank <clears throat> you.
Mr. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Chaffetz, uh, do you remember the uh, April 7th, 2014 staff report? Yes. I'd ask that that be placed in the record. Without objection, it will be made a part of the record. Thank you. Uh, April 7th, 2014, uh, extensive documentation about the, the cover, the not, not cover-up, but what we'd already discovered. And then June 20th, 2014, since the start of this investigation, every email has been preserved. Thanks. Now, that's a quote under oath by the commissioner, correct? Yes. I want to, you know, you and I are not lawyers, so we'll, we'll tax each other a little bit on a constitutional question. Uh, according to Wikipedia, at least, the, ch the, def the definition of high crimes and misdemeanor constitutionally says it covers allegation of misconduct, particular of particularly of officials, such as perjury of oath, abuse of authority, bribery, intimidation, misuse of assets, comma, failure to supervise, dereliction of duty, conduct unbecoming, refusal to obey a lawful order slash subpoena. So I just want to go through the last several there. Is it your understanding that high crimes and misdemeanors include failure to supervise? Yes. Dereliction of duty? Yes. Conduct unbecoming? Yes. Refusal to obey a lawful order? Yes. Under both your chairmanship and my chairmanship, did we issue subpoenas that were in fact not obeyed? Yes, August of 2013 and February 14th of 2014. Just before leaving office, uh, I issued a December 23rd, 2014 staff report. Do you remember that yes. one? I'd ask that that be placed in the record. Without objection, it will be made a part of the record. At that time, hadn't we as a committee already recognized that there had been failure to preserve, in other words, failure to obey the subpoena, a lawful order? Hadn't we already determined that there had been conduct unbecoming by Lois Lerner? Hadn't we already figured that the commissioner and his political appointed subordinates had failed to supervise and were guilty of dereliction of duty? Yes. And in July, I believe, of last year, didn't you call on the commissioner to resign? Yes. And uh, the ranking member very aptly mentioned that we've only had 19 impeachments in the history of, of this uh, great republic and that the, he had participated in many of them. But the history of impeachment, haven't we threatened impeachment or called on the resignation of cabinet and sub-cabinet officers hundreds and hundreds of times in, and on judges hundreds and hundreds of times and haven't they in the ordinary course either quit or been fired by the president? Yes, that's happened many times. So you're here today because almost a year ago, after multiple very lengthy documents, after millions of dollars and countless thousands of hours, you had determined that, one, the, they had targeted conservatives or their belief at the IRS, that the commissioner had come in and that he had been guilty of failure to properly supervise, given us false statements that either he knew were wrong, false or he was too lazy and too uh, negligent to, in fact, verify. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you're here because you've exhausted other remedies. Providing false testimony is to Congress. And rather than Congress continuing to whine and complain about the lack of inaction in the executive branch, the founders gave us tools, and they gave us tools to defend ourselves and take care of ourselves and, and to uh, provide a consequence. Mr. Chairman, uh, are you familiar with the criminal referral by the Ways and Means Committee against yes. Lois Lerner? Yes. And under that, as I understand, uh, the law said that the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia shall present to a grand jury those criminal articles against Lois Lerner. Uh, what happened to those? Um, there there was no criminal referral. After 10, minute, 10 months of review, they decided not to present those to the grand jury. So even though the Ways and Means Committee under a statute had delivered a document that ordered the U.S. Attorney to perform an act under this Justice Department of this President, they chose to not obey that law. Isn't that correct? Uh, that's my understanding. So if you were to do similarly and refer the IRS Commissioner uh, specifically for his false statements, and if you found it for criminal purposes, 
you would expect the same thing to happen, that it would not be presented. Perhaps, and different members have different views on this, I look at this as the remedy that uh, the founders gave us. It hasn't been exercised in a while, but that is the tool that they gave us. And you're here today uh, just after the General Accountability Office, a nonpartisan part of Congress, found that conservative groups are still being targeted as we speak. Is that correct? That is correct. In fact, they said, quote, could select organizations for examinations in an unfair manner. Ba and it goes on to say, based on an organization's religious, educational, political, and other views. Commissioner Koskinen has not resolved that problem. It continues today. And based on his most latest comments, he doesn't think he's misspoke in any way, shape, or form. So you're here today because you've exhausted other remedies and because the remedy for someone who has lost the confidence of the Congress, lost confidence of the American people, failed to fix a problem after more than two years, or if you will, failure to supervise, dereliction of duty, conduct unbecoming, and a refusal to obey lawful orders. That's why you're here, isn't it? It is. It's important to note that most uh, members uh, erroneously believe that when President Obama steps down and we get a new president, that the commissioner would naturally do that as well. That's not true. When he was confirmed in de December of 2013, his, his uh, commission, being the commissioner, continues until November of 2017. So the remedy is, I think, urgent. Uh, we have 90,000 good, hardworking people at the IRS, but they are mismanaged and they are being led by somebody who is lying to Congress. Final question. Kate Duvall uh, discovered on uh, on Super Bowl Sunday, m more than a month before the documents were destroyed, the tapes were destroyed, right. that they had this gap. Was she a polit non confirmed, but a political appointee, an appointee directly of this commissioner? Yes, she was. Thank you. I thank the chairman. Yield back. Chair thanks the gentleman, recognizes the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. Let me thank my colleagues for their presentation and their service to this nation. Uh, I hold the responsibilities, however, of the Judiciary Committee, sacrosanct and of uh, great uh, moment and great responsibility. Uh, we are the protectors of the Constitution. Uh, and as the authority given to us, this House, as a House having the sole authority uh, to uh, impeach, Though I note very clearly that this is not an impeachment hearing, I take the responsibility very seriously. To Mr. Conyers, let me say that I associate myself with your line of reasoning, and I promise not to hold your wisdom and experience and legal scholarship against you. So I thank you so very much for uh, all that you have offered to us. Bad behavior, um, inappropriate answering of questions, to my very fine witnesses uh, may be grounds for being in contempt of Congress and any other admonition that we'd want to give. I hold to two points that you've made, and that is that there must be a relationship between witnesses from the administration, no matter which administration it is, and Congress of forthrightness. I also hold to the point that the First Amendment, freedom of speech and thought, are, again, uh, very high callings of this nation, probably why so many uh, tried to immigrate to this nation because of the freedoms that we give. But I also think it's the responsibility of uh, Congress to be factual and temperate. So let me read this letter uh, to you uh, coming from the Department of Justice uh, recently. And that is, in collaboration with the FBI and Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, the Department's Criminal and Civil Rights Division conducted an exhaustive probe by the way, there were $20 million spent, 160,000 hours of staff work. We conducted more than 100 witness interviews, that was by the IRS, collected more than 1 million pages of IRS documents, analyzed almost 500 tax exemption applications, examined the role and potential culpability of scores of IRS employees, and considered the applicability of civil rights tax administration obstruction statutes. Our investigation uncovered substantial evidence of mismanagement, poor judgment, and institutional inertia, leading to the belief by many tax exempt applicants that the IRS targeted them based on their political viewpoints, but poor management is not a crime. 
We found no evidence that any IRS official acted based on political, discriminatory, corrupt, or other inappropriate motives that would support a criminal prosecution. We also found no evidence that any official involved in the handling of the tax exempt application or IRS leadership attempted to obstruct justice. Based on the evidence developed in this investigation, the recommendation of the experienced career prosecutors and supervising attorneys at the Department of Justice, at the Department, we are closing our investigation and will not seek any criminal charges. I realize that is not impeachment, but let me just say this, Mr. Chavis, if I could ask. Uh, no evidence was uncovered that the, any IRS employees have been directed to destroy or hide information from Congress, the DOJ, or TICA. Uh, do you um, want to quarrel with that extensive investigation? Uh, I think they're, you're conflating two different topics. Um, what we are most concerned about is Mr. Koskinen's actions under the subpoena. That is not what the IR, that is not what the FBI But the premise of the actions are dealing with the whole litany of issues. I looked at the 10 minute presentation. You had Ms. Lerner, you had all of that. Just answer yes or no. The premise is of course all the information uh, and charges made about discriminating against conservative groups. Are they not? The, the underlying concern and need for the investigation Came about and the documents, through, yes. through all of that, yes. fine. And so the basis of which the TICA and DOJ investigated, they found no evidence to suggest any crime. And so in respect to uh, the commissioner, then his answers uh, cannot be part of a crime if they found no basis for such crime. And if he's answering as best of his knowledge, then he cannot be uh, attributed, maybe a bad behavior, but he cannot be attributed to an impe uh, impeachable offense. Uh, let me also raise this question. Mr. Issa asked you. I would disagree you, with that, by the way. Uh, and that's why we have that right of disagreement. Yeah. And this is the impeachment committee. Mr. Issa asked you if we had threatened the impeachment of judges and cabinet officers hundreds and hundreds of times. You said yes. If that turns out to be untrue, have you given us uh, yourself a false testimony and should you be removed from office? Well, I hope I've given everything is accurate, but if I find that there is something inaccurate, I have a duty and obligation as swiftly as possible to correct the record. And in this case of Mr. Koskinen, he still stands by all those statements I showed you. He's, he doesn't believe he's made any misstatement to date, and uh, I, I think that's the difference. I respect your work, I respect you, and I respect Mr. DeSantis as well. I don't want to see any single group, conservative or otherwise, be discriminated against. As we review these materials, um, I believe, uh, even though this is not an impeachment proceeding, there are no impeachable offenses according to as, as we have defined them and in the Madison Papers, but I'd also say uh, that Mr. Uh, the IRS uh, Commissioner, uh, there is no definitive proof about him being connected to the underlying premise and to the best of his ability all of the materials that we have, including um, even though the DOJ did not point as directly to the subpoena, suggest that he answered it as effectively and truthfully as he can. Would the general lady yield? Be happy to yield. Um, in the time case, the gentlewoman has expired without objection, the gentlewoman is uh, recognized for an additional minute so she can yield to the gentleman from California. I thank both of you. Uh, in the case of the Scooter Libby conviction, uh, my understanding is he gave un was a alleged to have given untruthful statement about what ultimately was determined not to be a crime. He had no part in revealing the Valerie Plain uh, identity, and uh, yet he still uh, was disbarred and uh, and criminally indicted. So my understanding is false testimony or failure or dereliction of duty is still impeachable, whether or not the Justice Department determines there's a crime, I, I think uh, Mr. Conyers would confirm that that's not, I don't believe that that's a question before us as to uh, the Commissioner's possibility of being found to have failed to meet his, his obligations, which is the allegation that underlies the Chairman. I yield back. Let me, if, if I may, just in a moment's time left over, um, Scooter Libby had personal knowledge of the facts, the underlying facts. This is a point that I was making. Um, I do not see any proof here, including the 10-minute presentation, to suggest that Commissioner uh, Koskinian um, had any personal knowledge of the uh, facts and the occurrences. To the best of his ability, being the commissioner, he directed 160,000 hours, $20 million, and could not uh, find or presented what he could find and represented that he presented what he could find. And previously, the DOJ and uh, the uh, uh, Treasury Inspector General found 
nothing that said that the IRS was uh, discriminating against conservative groups uh, and uh, liberal groups. I stand with the president, which says if it's being done, I'm the gentleman up. has expired. But, uh, the commissioner is not impeachable at this time. I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the witnesses for not only your testimony, but your deep and diligent uh, due effort here on this. And also, uh, Chairman Issa, in, in leading on this, this goes so deep as I listen to this testimony here today and um, try to make sense of this timeline. But I'd like to back up a little bit and, and ask you, uh, Chairman Chavis, what was the first date that the public became aware or you became aware that there was a problem with the IRS potentially targeting conservative organizations? I think that goes back to 2011, if I recall, Dave Camp uh, and the Ways and Means Committee. That would be the first formal with his letter uh, to the IRS. Uh, but it must have been in the public eye prior to that. Are we working with a date that's probably uh, a, a half a year ahead of that period of time? I don't recall when the first complaints started to come in, but there were groups that were complaining that their applications were being held for unknown reasons. And this was uh, under then IRS Commissioner Doug Schulman. There have been a couple of different IRS commissioners through this process, yes. And, and so uh, I would turn to this. The tapes were destroyed. Do we know the exact date that they were destroyed? Yes, we do. I believe it was March 4th, if I recall, 2014. Okay, March 4th, 2014. If we know the exact date, then do we know the name of the individual that physically destroyed them? Uh, the Inspector General did interview some people who work there. I don't have that name at my fingertips, but it is in the... I believe in the TIGDA report, or I'd have to confirm that, but they did. Okay. We're relying on the Inspector General who interviewed these people. Mm -hmm. But, but we, th we think that we, we do know the name of that individual. The Inspector General knows the name of that individual. Uh, would you have any knowledge as to uh, whether um, Commissioner Koskinen had confronted that individual to ascertain the truth as you would if you were a manager? I believe the Inspector General uh, testified, as I recall, that he saw no evidence that there was any attempt or communication with them to confirm the existence of these tapes. And again, the Inspector General found them in, in 15 days. And so we're dealing with, among other, um, uh, other allegations here, a perjury and obstruction of justice. And um, I would ask if you've speculated um, as to why one would leave themselves vulnerable for such charges. Uh, what could be, um, let's say, more imposing than such charges? And either witness would be happy to hear. Um, it's hard to understand, nor can I definitively identify the motive. Um, but I also think there is an underlying belief uh, in the executive branch that the, that the legislative branch isn't going to stand up for itself. I think, I think that permeates far beyond this. I think they know they can run out the clock, they can provide or not provide, and just ignore. I mean, for this hearing here today, the IRS commissioner was invited to, to testify, and he just said no. I just believe it would be um, completely possible to impeach him without inviting him back again, and I would just encourage that. And if he were to invite himself, we should consider his request. Mr. DeSantis, do you have something to add to this uh, that I've left out? Well, I just think that it's frustrating because if a taxpayer treated the IRS the way the IRS has treated the Congress, that just wouldn't fly. I think we all know that. I think you can talk to people who've had dealings with the IRS in the private sector, and they laugh when you say, you know, could you have just destroyed, uh, allowed evidence to be destroyed that was a subject of a summons? Or, you know, what if you made false statements? Is that fine? Or what if they asked you to do certain things and you just decided not to do it? And I've yet to find somebody that thinks that would be acceptable. Okay, but are we addressing here the real central point? Because I think there's another point. And, and I think it is that there must have been a motive. Um, if the IRS comes to me and insists that they have my documents, and I'm going to provide them because it's easier to do so than it is to face the wrath of the IRS, as each of you have testified. But when you're appointed to clean up the agency of the IRS as their commissioner, you know there's a problem that you've inherited, and there's 24,000 missing emails in that. Is it possible that those emails could trace back and thread to the highest reaches of government at the most famous address in the United States of America, perhaps? I've seen no evidence of that, but I will tell you that 
you look at what happened with Lois Lerner, she pled the fifth. That's her constitutional right, and I respect that. But you can also see correspondence where it was, quote, unquote, perfect, that they couldn't search her, her text messages. And the, you know, within days of the Dave Camp letter going to the IRS, her hard drive crash. I mean, what a coincidence. But I have seen no direct evidence that I can point to, nor is it central to the impeachment resolution, which goes directly to what Mr. Koskinen did and did not do under a subpoena and his testimony before Congress. And in brief conclusion, uh, what's the statute of limitations on these charges that have been chronicled here? I have no idea. Thank you, witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks the gentleman. Recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I found the video to be very uh, artistic and um, well. Thank you. Uh, very. I take that as a huge compliment. Thank very you. Our Almost, staff will be most pleased to hear that. I would say it was professionally uh, produced. Uh, what staffer was it that uh, was responsible for the production of this video? We have, I'll get you the names, uh, but we have a, a, a number of people on our staff. And you, you uh, who, come with who, me and I'll show you and I'll introduce who, him to you who myself. Was, who was primarily responsible for the production of that video? Well, Rebecca Edgar is the head of the communications group. We have uh, MJ Henshaw, who's very involved. We have Alex, we have Ashton, we got a number of people. And I'll, right after this hearing, if you want, I'll walk back and introduce him to you. Okay, and they were, those names that you just mentioned, all of those people are on congressional staff, is that correct? If the question is, did we produce it uh, internally, no, yes. No, my question is, all of the people who you just named are on congressional staff. Yes. And they were the ones responsible. Yes, I believe there's one person who worked on it who no longer works for Congress, but when he worked on it, he did work for Congress. Did anybody work on that video who was not a member of congressional staff? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. The, the voiceover was uh, Alex, and I'll introduce you to her if you like. Okay, and um, now what, uh, was that congressional, was that uh, video produced by those congressional employees while they were on congressional time? Or? Yes, oh, absolutely. Okay. Was any of it produced outside of congressional time? I don't believe so. And uh, what equipment was used to produce that video? We have a lot of Apple products, and I can show them to you. I can't name them off the top of my head. Were they all congressionally owned yes. uh, equipment? Yeah. And um, how has that video been used outside of Congress? We have made it public a few months ago. It's available on our website. We tweet it out, Facebook, Instagram. It's, it's out there pretty far and wide. We have about and, and just over 9,000 hits on it. All of that is on congressional social media. Is that correct? I believe so. I mean, I'd like to get it out there more. I'm glad you're talking about it. Go to oversight.house.gov and go see it yourself. Has the video under the direction of congressional employees ever been used for a non-congressional purpose, to your knowledge? I, I couldn't testify uh, about that. I have no I mean, once it's out there in the public and on the website, there are untold number of people that can, uh, can cite that link and... Was any of the footage that was edited and used in this production derived from congressional sources? Or was it solely non-congressional sources that the... Well, there are clips, for instance, at the beginning yeah. of news media. Uh-huh. We have Those a clip were obviously uh, not congressional uh, video. Correct. But were there any uh, video that was used, or were there any clips of congressional video that was used in the production of this video that we saw today? I, I'd have to go look. I mean, there are an awful lot of clips in there, um, but I would have to go look. Okay, now let me ask you this question. The Senate Finance Committee 
uh, investigated this uh, this IRS issue, correct? Yeah. And the uh, Treasury Inspector General, Treasury Department Inspector General, also investigated. Isn't that correct? Let me amend the previous answer and, and, and uh, tell you that what we looked at was what Mr. Koskinen did and did okay, not well, let, go. Let, let no, me, if, if you want clarity, I, I want I'll, you, I'll give it to you. Well, I just want you to answer my question. Isn't it a fact that DOJ, Department of Justice, investigated this uh, IRS issue? I, I, what I'm trying to say yes is there's, no. they issue, there's, two, it, there's two parts to this. Okay, they, they entered, right. well, you, you don't want to answer my question about No, I do. I want to give you a complete committee. answer. And the complete the answer DOJ is The DOJ and the Treasury Inspector General, all three of those entities investigated this so-called scandal involving the IRS, and each one no, came to that's the, not true. Each one that's not came true. to the conclusion that no. there was no criminal Disagree. intent on anyone's part Mr. to Chairman, violate the Mr. law. Chairman, Isn't that can correct? we have regular order, please? The gentleman's over his time. The Isn't time of the gentleman has expired. Well, I'd ask the, general, the uh, chairman for an additional one minute to finish uh, eliciting responses to the questions that I asked. And I would object, what, Mr. Chairman. Will you let him answer? I'd love for him to answer the question that I asked. Okay, well, as opposed it, well, to well, then let him talk. The regular order. The gentleman is recognized for an additional minute with the understanding that the gentleman will yield to the witnesses so they can answer your question. Well, I'll restate my question then. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Isn't it a fact that the Senate Finance Committee, the Department of Justice, and the Treasury Inspector General all investigated this alleged IRS scandal that is the subject of this hearing today, and each one of those entities found that there is no evidence whatsoever that anyone acted with criminal intent. Isn't that a fact? No. Um, what the Senate Finance Committee said, there was, quote, bipartisan agreement that the IRS showed a lack of candor, end quote. You that was the my question. I, Give me a time to answer that question. The, the, that the, requires a yes or no. It requires a complete answer because you're conflating two issues. One issue was the investigation into Lois Lerner and her actions on her emails. This impeachment resolution that we have put forward deals with Mr. Koskinen and his actions, his ability to tell the truth and, and how he misled Congress. That is not something the FBI looked at. In fact, so you're not in fact my yes, question. I am. And in fact, it would be duly noted that the FBI never interviewed Mr. Koskinen, never interviewed him. I didn't mention the FBI. I said the You said DOJ. the Department of Justice, I believe. I you said, said the DOJ. Well, they're part of the Department of Justice. my question. <laughs> the time of the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Appreciate the witnesses being here today because this is important since the Internal Revenue Service is the only entity of which I'm aware in the federal government that can ignore the Constitution as part of its job. Nobody else gets to ignore the Constitution, but they can take people's money without due process. They can take their property. They can move in and destroy a business that took a lifetime to build, and they have done that. So it is particularly important that the agents that work for such an agency that can ignore the Constitution must itself be completely overwhelmed with integrity. And what we have seen is not the case. I know and have known IRS agents who are as fine and honest a people as walk the earth. I have heard from IRS agents who were, have been furious privately to see the kind of corruption and dishonesty that has overwhelmed the top of the Internal Revenue Service because, for, as one told me, when she just filed an amended tax return because she had forgotten $600, even though she still had a refund coming back, she was called in and was going to be fired because IRS agents have to be so above board 
that their integrity could never be questioned until you get to the supervisors and above. And that's where the rot is occurring and the stink is getting overwhelming. One of the judges in Tyler, Texas, federal judge William Lane Justice, he did uh, legislate from the bench was wrong. But that man had such an incredible sense of integrity. Had he been listening to Commissioner Koskinen, the man would have spent time in jail before he finished his testimony. He had no use for people that would come in and obfuscate as this man has done. Now, back under the Bush administration, in this committee, we had an attorney general come in here and under questionings about the national security letters, he testified from the very table our witnesses are sitting at that there were no known abuses of the national security letters. They were something like the IRS might use, demanding production of documents without going through a judge. He testified similarly in front of Chuck Schumer's committee and then it was later found, and I watched a replay of the testimony late one night, where he testified, oh, well, it turns out that he had a IG report on his desk three days before he testified before the Senate that indicated there were thousands of abuses of the national security letter. And that he didn't know that, and under very tough questioning from Senator Schumer, he said, look, it was on my desk for three days, that's true, but I just never really looked at it, so I didn't know I wasn't lying. I was so outraged at the lack of integrity or the incompetence, whichever, of something that important, I called the White House Chief of Staff and said, you've got to get rid of this guy. He cannot be defended by Republicans again. This is outrageous, and my question not just to the witnesses, but to all my colleagues across the aisle, is where is the Democrat with the righteous indignation for this kind of obfuscation and dishonesty that will call the White House and say, as I did of an attorney general, this man has to go, and within a month, that attorney general was gone. I would love to see the Democrat that still has that kind of righteous indignation to stand up and call it as it is without regard to party. I yield back. Chair thanks the gentleman and recognizes the uh, <clears throat> the uh, gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Delbaney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Congressman Bustani told a reporter that the House's time would be better spent continuing to investigate the IRS's treatment of organizations seeking tax-exempt status as opposed to whatever you'd like to call this grandstanding on impeachment. Because let's remember, this is not even an impeachment hearing. And I agree with our colleague from Louisiana. Um, you can think whatever you like about Commissioner Koskinen, but what we're doing today does absolutely nothing to bring truth to light except maybe show that the record our witnesses have presented is thin at best. I think Senator Hatch summed it up well. He said, quote, we can have our disagreements with him, but that doesn't mean there's an impeachable offense, unquote. The real ele elephant in the room today is that the IRS actually does have significant issues, substantiated ones, that Congress should be talking about. I regularly hear from constituents who are worried about identity theft after their data at the IRS was compromised. Others who find it infuriating that they have to pay money to an expert just to file their taxes um, because the tax code is so complicated. And even worse, constituents who can't even get through to the IRS by phone for assistance during filing season because the agency has become so underfunded it can barely serve American taxpayers. If we really want to improve government accountability and efficiency for the benefit of the American people, let's start talking about getting our constituents a good return on their investment. Let's commit in earnest to solving some of these issues, and let's stop wasting time on, on circuses like this. When the vast majority of the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats alike, can agree that the evidence to support impeaching Commissioner Koskinen is not there, I think it's time to move on from these games and do some real work. 
I yield back. Chair, thanks. The gentlewoman and recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for five thank, minutes. Uh, I thank the chairman and thank uh, Chairman Goodlatte for having this important uh, hearing today. John Koskinen had several duties. He breached every single one. He had a duty to preserve documents under subpoena. He had a duty to produce those documents that were under subpoena. He had a duty to disclose to Congress if he couldn't preserve and produce those documents that were under subpoena. He had a duty to do that in a timely fashion. He had a duty to testify accurately. He had a duty to correct the record if, in fact, he testified in an inaccurate fashion. He breached every single duty he had, and that's what Congressman Chaffetz and Congressman DeSantis have outlined for us all here this morning. No wonder the guy didn't show up. If I had that kind of record, I don't think I'd have showed up today either. I mean, never forget what happened here. The Internal Revenue Service and the power that it has over American citizens' lives systematically targeted fellow citizens for their political beliefs. They did it for a sustained period of time, and they got caught. And when they got caught, they did what a lot of people do when they get caught. They lied about it, right? Remember, May 10th. Three years ago this month, May 10th, Lois Lerner, Bar Association speech here in town, trying to get ahead of the story before TIG is actually going to release the first report, not the one we're talking about today, but the first report, trying to get ahead of the story. The central figure at a Bar Association meeting has a friend ask a planted question, and Lois Lerner says what? Wasn't me, wasn't Washington, it was those folks in Cincinnati. Complete lie. Twelve days later, May 22nd, she takes the fifth. Interestingly enough, the same day that the IRS tells themselves, preserve all documents. Same day Lois Lerner's taking the fifth, the IRS says, preserve all documents. May 22nd of 2013. Now, when the central figure lies and then takes the fifth, it sort of puts a premium on getting the documents and the information and all her communications, right? And so then comes in Mr. Koskinen. And when he's when he is hired, when he's confirmed, here's what the president said. We need, quote, new leadership that can help restore confidence going forward. That's what he was brought in to do. And I would argue, based on breaching all six duties he had, he's done anything but restore confidence. So under his watch, as we learned from the good testimony today from Mr. Chaffetz and Mr. DeSantis, what happens? He allows 422 backup tapes to be destroyed. When he learns about it, he waits four months before he tells us the Congress doing an investigation. He doesn't even know, and he doesn't even check on any other backup tapes that exist because we, we found out there were 700 others that weren't destroyed that could have helped us. He didn't even check when he told us that some of these had been destroyed, which leads us to the one question I have. And I want to thank the chairman again for this hearing and the, and the second hearing that's coming. But, Mr. DeSantis, is the standard in your judgment, is the standard for impeachment a criminal intent standard? No, I think that's pretty clear. If you look at Alexander Hamilton in The Federalist, he said that uh, impeachment was about the violation of public trust and that those offenses are uh, inherently political as they relate more to injuries done to the society and the way the government works. And then Joseph Story and his commentaries on the Constitution several decades later um, said that these need to be thought of as political offenses growing out of misconduct or gross negligence uh, or usurpation or other disregard for the public interest. And um, he said that they must be examined upon very broad and comprehensive uh, principles of public policy and duty. Gross negligence, dereliction of duty, breach of public trust, right? Sure. Mr. Chaffetz, you think? I think Mr. Koskinen exhibited some gross negligence in his conduct over the last several months in trying to help us get to the bottom of this scandal? Absolutely. You think there was a dereliction of duty? Yes. It seems to me a dereliction of duty when you wait four months to tell Congress, right? His, his chief counsel knew in February of 2014 that there were problems and a gap in learners' emails, and he doesn't tell us until June. His chief lawyer knew. And he waits four months. And the reason he told us he waited four months was because he was doing his due diligence to make sure that actually happened. And part of that due diligence wasn't even checking to see if there were backup tapes available. I think that's dereliction of duty. And obviously, when, when you look at this, and here's the other thing, breach of public trust. Oh, my goodness. We just heard the Democrats talk about problems at the IRS. They said the cybersecurity breach. We had GAO tell us the tax gap at IRS is 385. So they're, they're, 
$385 billion. Their fundamental duty is to collect revenue due to the federal treasury. They can't even fulfill that, but they got time to target people and make sure they destroy backup tapes in the course of an investigation. I mean, for goodness sake, this is certainly breach of public trust, dereliction of duty and negligence in gross, gross form. Mr. Chairman, again, I want to thank you for this first hearing. Look forward to the second one. We're going to have some experts, I believe, come in and talk about the standard that has to be met to get rid of someone who's conducted himself the way Mr. Koskinen has. But I thank you for this and look forward to the next hearing. I yield back. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've had the opportunity to serve in the Congress now uh, for about three and a half years. And to me, I think the greatest uh, evidence of gross negligence, dereliction of duty, breach of public trust was when members of this body in October of 2013 decided for purely political reasons that you were going to shut down the government for 16 days and cost the economy $24 billion in lost economic activity. And yet we have to sit here at this hearing and be lectured about alleged gross negligence and breach of trust. People need to look at their own conduct, their own behavior, and how that's impacted the American people and their bottom line, rather than subject us to this taxpayer-funded fishing expedition. Because there's an addiction that some have, not the distinguished chairman who's sitting before us right now, but there's an addiction that some have in this body to impeachment. Now let me ask Mr. DeSantis a question. Do you think that President Barack Obama has committed an impeachable offense during his seven plus years in I've office? Never, um, I've never argued that and, and it, it's really irrelevant. I think the IRS is within the context of the IRS and that's what we're focusing on. Okay, now the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee is Orrin Hatch, is that correct? Yes. And he's got jurisdiction over the IRS as chairman of the Finance Committee, is that right? Yes. And he's a well-respected member of Congress, correct? Yes. Man of integrity? Yes. And he stated, we can have our disagreements with him, meaning the IRS commissioner, but that doesn't make it an impeachable offense. Is that correct? Um, I think what Senator Hatch and the Senate Finance Committee may be uh, looking at may be different than what we're looking at. Many of these statements that I believe were false and misleading happened in the House of Representatives. And I would also note that the Senate Finance Committee came to a conclusion that, quote, bipartisan agreement that IRS showed a lack of candor, end quote. Now, the essence of this controversy, as I understand it, relates to the possible destruction of documents. Do you believe that that destruction was intentional or was it incompetence? Uh, the IRS would argue that it's accidental and let's take their word for it for a moment. That's not acceptable. When there's a duly issued subpoena, they have a legal obligation to protect and preserve, and they did not do that. Now, in terms of what the IRS may have said, let's put that uh, to the side for a second. J. Russell George is the Treasury Department Inspector General. Is that correct? Yes. Man of integrity? Yes, I believe so. Well-respected yes. Inspector General? Bush appointee, is that right? I think originally he also had worked previously for the Oversight and Government Reform Committee at one point. Okay, Republican appointee. Now, uh, did the report that he issued uncover any evidence of intentional destruction of evidence by the IRS? I was very careful in my comments to, su there, to separate out um, what had happened with Lois Lerner in the emails and the actions by Mr. Koskinen himself. The Inspector General did not look and investigate what Mr. Koskinen, uh, you know, the totality of what's in our resolution. Now, the <coughs> Inspector General's report concluded, quote, the investigation did not uncover evidence that the IRS and its employees purposely erased the tapes in order to conceal responsive emails from the Congress, the DOJ, or the Inspector General. Is that correct, that finding in the report, page three, I paragraph two? I, I believe you have that stated that accurate. Okay, so what I'm trying to understand is we're here considering an impeachment 
proceeding. Perhaps the most severe remedy available to Congress as it relates to a separate but co-equal branch of government, where a Republican appointed Inspector General concluded that the underlying act that we should all be concerned about was accidental, not intentional. But we then have a theory that even though the Republican appointed Inspector General concluded that the underlying act, if anything, was based on incompetence, it wasn't intentional, that the IRS commissioner subsequently came before Congress to conceal something that itself, while incompetent, wasn't criminal, according to the Republican appointed Inspector General. I just think that this is respectfully uh, a remedy in search of a problem and that we have better things that we could be doing with our taxpayer dollars to put the American people in a better place in terms of their quality of life and I yield back. Chairman, can I respond to that? Yeah, the time of the gentleman has expired, but the witnesses will be allowed to respond briefly. Uh, the first question you have to ask is, did they destroy documents that were under subpoena? I think the answer is clearly yes. Whether you believe that was an accident or intentional, that really will be for the next hearing that we have next month about what is the standard for impeachment. I don't believe you have to prove intent in order to get there. And to the 60,000 people, constituents of yours and mine and others, that will get a subpoena and that will get a summons from the IRS, is it good enough for them to just come back and say, you know, I had those documents and by golly, it was an accident, I destroyed them all. Do you think that's going to fly? Heck no. No way. And so that, that's a, a fairly weak argument. The question is, did they destroy documents that were, that, were, that were under subpoena? The answer is yes. Did they provide false and misleading testimony to Congress? Yes, and on more than one occasion. And, and if that, that testimony was not accurate and they wanted to correct it, they had a duty and obligation to do it, and they never did do it. And I could go on. Chair, thanks, gentlemen, and recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Marino, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Let me read you a summary <coughs> that was put together concerning a method by which we could address these matters, uh, not only to gather information, but from a criminal standpoint. Under the Constitution and its separation of powers, principle and structure, Congress has no direct role in federal law enforcement nor in triggering or initiating the appointment of any prosecutor for a particular matter. Congress has a legislative role in designing a statutory mechanism for the appointment of independent counsels or special prosecutors, as it did in Title VI of the Ethics in Government Act of 1978. Under the provisions of that law relating to the appointment of independent counsel called special prosecutors until 1983, the Attorney General was directed to petition a special three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals to name an independent counsel upon the receipt of credible allegations, which we have here, of criminal misconduct by certain high-level personnel in the executive branch of the federal government whose prosecution by the administration might give rise to an appearance of a conflict of interest. In 1999, Congress, in its infinite wisdom, allowed the independent counsel provision law to expire. Upon the expiration of the law in June of 1999, no new independent counsel or special prosecutors may be appointed by a three-judge panel upon the application of the Attorney General. The Attorney General, retains the general authority to designate or name individuals as special counsel to conduct investigations or prosecutions of particular matters or individuals on behalf of the United States. As a result, and as a result of what has taken place uh, with the IRS and, and how untruthful they've been, I am personally moving forward to drop legislation that reenacts Title VI of the Ethics in Government Act of 1978, where independent counsel can be appointed to investigate these matters so justice can be served. And I yield back. Chair thanks the gentleman and recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island. 
for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin, I want to stress that I have a great deal of respect for the two members before the committee today. I've been fortunate to have worked with both of them on legislation and recognize the sincerity of their views. However, I must respectfully disagree with the conclusions they have drawn today before this committee. My friend and colleague, Chairman Shavitz, has called for the impeachment of IRS Commissioner John Kuskin, and, and he argues that the commissioner has obstructed justice, perjured himself before a congressional committee, and has failed to provide oversight of the investigation of the IRS. The Treasury Inspector General for, the Te for Tax Administration, the Senate Finance Committee, and the Department of Justice, however, have each conducted their own investigation into the so-called IRS targeting scandal. And while these investigations uncovered various management problems at the IRS, there was no evidence to support allegations of criminal activity or politically motivated behavior. There was no evidence to support allegations that Commissioner Kostinen deliberately misled Congress or attempted to obstruct a congressional committee. In fact, each of these investigations found no evidence whatsoever that the commissioner has acted in bad faith. Under his direction, the IRS spent $20 million and has devoted more than 160,000 hours to collect, review, and produce 1.3 million pages of documents to investigating committees. This includes over 78,000 emails sent or received by Lois Lerner, including over 24,000 emails that were affected by Ms. Lerner's hard drive crash. Hard to, challenge, uh, it's, it, hard to challenge this as an attempt to stonewall, I'm sorry, hard to characterize this as an attempt to stonewall, hinder, or otherwise obstruct a congressional investigation. The overall record built on multiple investigations fails to support the allegations leveled in this hearing. I regret that we are not addressing many of the issues at the IRS that were raised by the gentlelady from Washington that would have a real impact on the uh, services provided to our constituents. I also regret that we're not using the time today to hold a hearing on criminal justice reform, gun violence prevention, legislation to protect the intellectual property rights of artists and musicians, or comprehensive immigration reform. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman and recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was thinking to myself as Chairman Jordan was talking about uh, kind of the history, the chronology of this investigation, as these two witnesses well know, there were, what, about a half dozen defenses offered by the IRS throughout the course of this investigation, um, each of which collapsed uh, uh, under its own uh, illogic. I, it began with the two people in, in Ohio that were blamed, and then it went to, uh, to my personally my favorite defense, which was that the IRS is too incompetent to be able to construct a scheme as sophisticated as this scheme was, and then they moved from that defense to the, yeah, but we also targeted progressives too, so at least we were equal in our discrimination. And then my favorite, the one they settled on towards the end, was, yeah, but the president himself did not personally approve this targeting scheme, therefore, you don't need to look at it anymore. I know the next hearing, uh, is about the uh, the process that you know Koskinen had mentioned due process in his in his uh, opening statement that he didn't give uh, to us, and the next hearing is about um, what process is due the procedural part of due process, whereas this one is more of the substantive part of the due process analysis. And I am interested, um, as other members are, what elements need to be proven. What's the standard of proof? Is it clear and convincing evidence? Is it preponderance? Is it beyond a reasonable doubt? Does anyone know? Do the rules of evidence apply? Uh, can you use hearsay? Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested ahead, in that. But Chairman Chaffetz, um, you said something uh, that, I, that I wrote down, which doesn't happen very often, but it did happen today, which is uh, that impeachment is a penalty. It's a punishment. And you're exactly right. It is. It's a punishment. What Congress really wants is access to the documents and the witnesses. Because that is the lifeblood of any investigation. You cannot conduct an investigation if you don't have access to the documents and the witnesses. We know that. Unfortunately, those who seek to not be investigated also know that. So until this body begins to incrementally uh, assert itself, with, with impeachment acknowledged being the ultimate penalty. By the way, I want to make sure, I, I, I want to make sure since I have two experts, in, well, one for sure, expert in front of me, and then the chairman of oversight, 
<laughs> Did I hear correctly that incompetence is not an impeachable offense? Because I always believe that malfeasance in office or the failure to perform the duties of your office could be an impeachable offense. Is that your understanding as well? It can be a factor, yes. So how can incompetence be a defense when the allegation is incompetence? <laughs> if that's what we're alleging, I mean, it doesn't have to be a crime. The, the notion that you can only impeach someone who commits a, an actual violation of the criminal code is nonsense. There, there, there are lots of ways to screw up in your job that don't rise to the level of meeting the U.S. criminal code. So the notion, if I heard it correctly, that incompetence is a defense to an allegation of being incompetent, it's hard for me to get my head around that. All right, let me ask you this, either Chairman DeSantis or Chairman Chaffetz. Mr. Koskinen um, said every email has been preserved. Was that true or false? False. So if it's false, then the next line of inquiry was whether or not it would be intentionally false, negligently false, whether or not he had a duty to investigate but did not, did not perform that duty. I guess that's what we want to investigate, right? Not the falsity of it, but the nature of the falsehood. Go ahead. Yeah, and I mean, I, you know, you're a prosecutor. Now, these aren't criminal offenses, but you remember 18 U.S.C. 1001. Um, uh, a reckless disregard for whether a statement is true or a conscious effort to avoid learning the truth of a statement can be construed as actually construed as making a knowingly false statement. And so we're in a situation here where, at best, he just simply refused to avail himself of the proper facts and came to Congress and testified under oath and made a statement that's just factually incorrect. I also have a note, backup tapes from 2011 no longer exist. Uh, was that true or false? That, that is true. Now, they went back and they were able to find some, yeah. but some were, as they call it, degaused. So, so it would be false to say they no longer exist. Clearly, they exist because somebody went and found them. It's how you define degaussing, but some of them went through this degaussing process, well, which you're is essentially about destroyed. You're losing. Uh, exactly, but that was their defense. That was what they suggested. I mean, they, it's, it's a little tricky because they, they destroyed a lot of tapes, obviously, but then there were other tapes that the inspector general just, when, after the commissioner made the statement, they just hopped in their car, went to West Virginia, asked for tapes, and they found a bunch of tapes. And uh, I think there were 1,000 unique emails that they were able to find off those tapes. So when the commissioner said that there were no backup tapes at the time he said that, that was false. Well, I know I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, but I'm looking forward to the next panel because I, I am interested in hearing how incompetence can be a defense to an allegation of incompetence, and I think it would be the law professors that will have to explain that one to us. The Chair, so thanks, back. gentlemen, and uh, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, for five minutes. Thanks, the Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Uh, um, one of these incidents is with the IRS includes uh, – a group of folks in Texas, Catherine Engelbrecht, you all know her, and just put it back in the record. Uh, in July of 2010, they filed for an IRS nonprofit status for True the Vote and King Street Patriots in Texas. In December of 2010, the FBI Domestic Terrorism Unit inquired about one of the meetings. They came back in January of 2011, the FBI. All of a sudden, having never been audited by the IRS ever, the Catherine Engelbrecht and their, their personal uh, finances were uh, audited by uh, the IRS for 2008, 2009. Uh, true the vote in, in March of 2011, IRS questions about the non inter introduced non excuse me, questions on nonprofit application. Uh, once again, in May of 2011, the FBI shows up uh, for at the one of their meetings, October of 2011. Once again, the IRS sends more questions, second round. And some of these questions were including, where have you spoken? Who did you speak to? What are the list of the people who were there? What did you say? And give us a copy of this speech and all your future speeches. IRS inquiry. And then in June of 2011, once again, FBI uh, inquiry, 
November, December, FBI inquiry. Once again, the truth of the vote was, uh, had more questions. Third round from the IRS. Uh, the King Street Patriots uh, had more questions from the IRS about their application. And then all of a sudden, February of 2012, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms shows up to investigate this organization. And then July of 2012, OSHA shows up to investigate their nonprofit requ request. And then the Texas Equ Commission on Environmental Quality showed up in November of 2012. And once again, fourth round of questions from the IRS, March of 2013, more questions from the IRS, and then once again in April of 2013, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms shows up again. So you got the FBI, you got OSHA, you got the, even the Harris County Terrorism Task Force showed up uh, to investigate these folks. All they're looking for is whether or not they can get an exemption from the IRS. Now, to me, this appears to be an abuse of the IRS working with other government agencies about this one issue of whether they should get tax-exempt status. Political persecution by the IRS. And as you mentioned, Mr. Chaffetz, in your open statement, the IRS knows how to get things done by their subpoena and their, their requests for information that they turn out. Apologize to the chairman. That's my mother-in-law calling. Um, she has her own ring. Anyway. Uh, They have ways of getting you to get give out there in a fruited plain to get this information. They show up all these different times trying to get information. To your knowledge, either one of you, has the IRS, any agent, any person, been held accountable for the abuse of power that they used against this one citizen back in Texas? No, I'm not aware of any. Uh, Mr. DeSantis? No. All of the accusations against the IRS, and there have been numerous, y'all have done all the investigation, all these different organizations who have been trying to get uh, tax exempt status. The abuses that have occurred, or the alleged abuses that have occurred, has anyone in the IRS been fired? No, Mr. Koskinen stands by all of his statements, even to this day. They claim it was an accident but nobody was dismissed, reprimanded, moved. I'm not aware of anybody having any consequence. And the GAO came back and studied it later and found that the situation is, is, is uh, dire, it's bad, and it's still available for targeting. And even <laughs> Lois Lerner uh, retired with full pension even though she had been held in contempt uh, of Congress. Nobody's going to jail. Nobody's going to jail. No. And you had a federal judge, what, three months ago? make the comment, the D.C. Circuit Court judge here in Washington make the comment that the IRS cannot be trusted. Y'all familiar with that statement by a federal judge after hearing one of these yes. lawsuits? Yep. All right. I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. I yield back to you. Chair, thanks to the gentleman and sends regards to the gentleman's mother-in-law <laughs> and uh, recognizes the other gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You know, I sometimes ask myself what I'm doing here in Congress. I get frustrated and sometimes depressed, sometimes angry, because I don't like the way things are going in Washington, D.C. We pass hundreds of bills just to see them die uh, in the Senate. The good stuff that does pass the Senate probably get vetoed by the President. The President regularly bypasses Congress, which what I consider to be illegal and unconstitutional executive orders. Am I wasting my time being here? But what pulls me through on this is remembering that we are the elected representatives of the people of the United States. And the people of the United States want us to do something. They're mad. They're angry. They don't like the gridlock in Washington, D.C. They don't like a big, intrusive government. They don't like the high taxes that they're having to pay. And you know what I think they like the least? being lied to by their elected representatives. Whether it's uh, the president with, if you like your health insurance, you can keep it, or his appointees like Mr. Koskinen. We have got to take a stand and say, we are not going to be lied to in Congress. 
You know, in Texas, there's an anti-litter campaign that says, don't mess with Texas. It's kind of become an unofficial motto of Texas. We need to reclaim some of our constitutional authority, and people need to be thinking, don't mess with Congress. When you're called to testify before a committee of Congress, or whether you're subpoenaed to produce documents, you should do so promptly, and you should do so truthfully. And it, I'm seeing an alarming trend. I think the administration and their officials have learned you can obfuscate, you can delay, and maybe the news cycle will forget it and it'll go away. But that's not the way it's supposed to work. That's not the way our founding fathers intended it. That's not the way the people who sent me to Washington, D.C. want to see it happen. They want us to do our job. They want us to hold the government accountable. Chairman Chaffetz, you chair the Government Oversight and Reform Committee. Are you seeing this same pattern? I, I am, and I think you've hit the uh, nail on the head, uh, Mr. Farenthold. I know you're passionate about these issues, uh, and, and that's in part why I came to Congress as well. The, the administration knows it can delay, and, um, and uh, we can't let them get away with that. And it's a principle. It should be true on both sides of the aisle. This is not a partisan issue. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. No, I mean, you, you, we saw it with Eric Holder. We saw it with Fast and Furious. We've seen it with Hillary Clinton's emails. It goes on and on. And this is our opportunity to take a stand. I'm a co-sponsor of your impeachment legislation on, uh, on Mr. Koskinen. Do you think the, uh, that proceeding with this will send the message to the administration and the alphabet soup of executive branch agencies, don't mess with Congress? I do. I believe the Constitution is an inspired document, and our founders put this mechanism in place specifically on civil officers. We studied this for three months with the House Counsel and determined that if you're confirmed by the Senate, the co-equal vote, vote to go into that highest echelon of government, impeachment is a process by which we can extract that person if they're not serving the best interests of the United States of America. Well, I'm also, uh, along with my colleague, Mr. Gowdy, looking forward to hearing uh, from the law professors, because my recollection from my constitutional law studies uh, 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 in San Antonio, Texas, was the impeachment clause means high crimes and misdemeanors and what can be impeached. Congress decides what those are. Exactly. And, uh, I, I think that it is our opportunity to reexert our authority and our oversight uh, prerogative, and I think it's critical to maintaining the republic that the government officials who are paid by the taxpayers answer truthfully and promptly to the taxpayers uh, representative and I commit would, to would the gentleman yield would the gentleman yield oh yes uh, with the remaining time there's been a lot said by the gentleman on the other side of the aisle about how the Department of Justice has found no crime no wrongdoing no targeting Mr. Chairman you've continued where I left off on the committee uh, do you find that to be inaccurate? In other words, is it fair to say that the Department of Justice's failure to see what you see so clearly as continued targeting is in fact part of a cover-up that continues today? They're, they're not seeing what is in plain sight is in fact part of the reason you're here. Potentially. One of the things that I'm concerned about is that the um, the FBI never interviewed Mr. Koskinen, and I would question the thoroughness in which they they came to these conclusions. I thank the gentleman for yielding. And my time has expired. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this investigation, I think, has yielded some interesting and very concerning results. I want to first start by thanking Mr. Issa for all his hard work on, the is on this issue when he chaired the Oversight Committee. And I also want to thank Mr. Chaffetz for continuing this investigation and getting us to this point. As I review the evidence and reports, the similarities between this and Watergate are staggering. I'm going to apologize. I'm going to be the second person to use Wikipedia today. But this is from Wikipedia. The term Watergate has come to encompass an array of clandestine and often illegal activities undertaken by members of the Nixon administration. Those activities included such dirty tricks as bugging the offices of political opponents and people of whom Nixon or his officials were suspicious. Nixon and his close aides order harassment of activist groups 
and political figures using the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the CIA, and the IRS. In July 1973, evidence mounted against the President's staff, including testimony provided by former staff members in an investigation conducted by the Senate Watergate Committee. The investigation revealed that President Nixon had a tape recording system in his office, offices and that he had recorded many conversations. After a protect, protracted series of bitter court battles, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the President was obligated to release the tapes to government investigators, and he eventually complied. These audio recordings Im implicated the President, and this is the key, revealing he had attempted to cover up not that he had participated in the crimes, but that he had attempted to cover up activities that took place after the break-in and to use federal investigation officials to deflect the investigation. As I listen to the testimony, as I listen to all the evidence, there is such an eerie simil similarity to Watergate. We had government officials that were persecuting their political enemies who were going after them using the IRS and other agencies. The difference is that unlike Watergate, we have lost the tape. We, don't, we can't prosecute these people because they destroyed the evidence. As far as we know, and as the evidence shows, and as history shows, Watergate did not include any destruction of evidence. They tried to hide the evidence, but they didn't destroy it because the Supreme Court was able to figure it out and was able to tell the um, Nixon administration to bring this evidence forward. But what I want to focus on today is, are these emails, which to me are like the Nixon tapes. Much like the 18 and a half minute gap of the Nixon tapes, the sheer convenience of a hard drive crash of multiple other high level officials experiencing six system crashes and the subsequent erasing of backup data is highly disturbing. As many of these emails were subject to congressional subpoenas, the potential of a true cover-up and of the undermining of democracy and of the democratic process becomes even more apparent in what we're talking about today. This committee, in my opinion, has a critical responsibility, and I hope that members from both sides of the aisle will give this matter the attention it deserves. And it actually saddens me that there's only one Democrat right now on the other side. The reason we got to the bottom of Watergate is because Republicans and Democrats decided to take the investigation seriously. Lois, Lois Lerner's hard, driving, hard drive crashed in June of 2011, as you indicated, eight days after the camp letter asking for the, for the information. TICTAS report detailing its investigation from June 13, 2014 through June 29, 2015, included a tracking of the crash hard drive and the procedures that took place. <laughs> Do you believe that the IRS followed the pro proper, proper protocols when addressing this crashed hard drive in 2011? No, I don't, I don't believe they did. The TICTA report of investigation identified six possible sources that would potentially recover the missing emails. To your knowledge, following receipt of the subpoena for the emails, how many of these sources were identified and examined by the IRS in an effort to comply with the subpoena? The Inspector General indicated that five of the six were not sought, nor were they investigated. Is there evidence, in your opinion, to suggest that the destruction of these, dis of these tapes was part of a concerted effort to not comply with the congressional subpoena? I want to be very careful not to overstep. We see nothing that implies direct intent. And I, I want to be very careful with that. But the, 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 uh, the IRS will call it an accident. Um, but again, as I've said many times before, um, that they had a legal duty to preserve, protect, to find, seek, and present those to the United States Congress. And to that, they did not do it. They, they call it an accident. I call it a series of unfor unfortunate coincidences. I think it's outrageous for anybody to think that this was a coincidence. And just to borrow from Watergate, I'd like to better understanding, and I hope that we can get to the bottom of this, of what Mr. Koskinen knew and when he knew it. And I think that's what this committee has a duty to find out. I, I do hope that people on both sides of the aisle will just look strictly at the fact, did they or did they not destroy the evidence? They did. Did they or did they not provide false testimony and mislead Congress? Yes, they did. 
when they knew it was wrong? Did they come back to Congress and correct it? No, they did not. There is a series and a pattern here that is not merely an accident. That, it, it goes beyond that. And whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, whether it's a Democrat administration or Republican administration, it shouldn't matter. You cannot destroy evidence that is under a duly issued subpoena. And there should be a consequence to that. And then you can't come to Congress and lie about it, which is clearly what happened here. Thank you. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, there uh, has been so much uh, very powerful and insightful testimony here today. And uh, my purpose here is to try, given the fact that we're coming down toward the end of this hearing, and try to bring us back to what this is all about. Uh, you know, not to become too foundational, but we do still hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, these are the key issues, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And for my uh, purposes, I think that this last sentence uh, of that that I just said is the most important, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Whenever we have a government that uses the power of the IRS or any of its police powers to deliberately coerce some of its citizens for their political views or for their religious views, that is by very definition ty tyranny. And it speaks against everything that is at the core of who this country really is. So. Uh, while we sometimes talk around the edges here, this is a very big issue. Did the government, did the Obama administration use their powers, police powers, their powers, the IRS, the powers to intimidate people because they disagreed with them politically? If they did, that is profound. And it is especially important for this committee who holds itself to be the guardian of the Constitution to respond to that. Now, it's very clear to me that coercion did occur. It's very clear to me that damage and impact uh, did occur uh, on some of these conservative organizations. It's very clear to me that evidence was destroyed. It's very clear to me that there seems to have been an, an astonishing coincidences, at least, uh, in that process. And it's very clear to me that, as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Chaffetz has said, that the IRS never made any attempt to come back and correct those things, if indeed this was all accidental. Um, what is not clear to me is why, in the face of this, we've seen such arrogance on the part of Mr. Koskinen and, the, and just such a, a, a flippant attitude that seems to, to be sort of characterizing this administration constantly that, whatever these great abiding principles of this country really are, they're put aside just flippantly for the sake of the political moment. And so I, I just want to suggest to you that I think this is an important thing. And so I, I'll, I'll ask this question to the witnesses, to both of them. I'll start with you, Mr. DeSantis. Do you think that in this case that the IRS, that the effect of their actions was to intimidate people based on their political persuasion? Well, in my opening statement, I told the story about campaigning for office for the first time in 2012 and, and asking to speak in front of a group that was in the process of applying for tax-exempt status, and they really freaked out about me being there because I was a political candidate. They were worried about the IRS, and at the time, I thought that they were just way paranoid, and I was like, give me a break. Why would the IRS care about it? And then when the scandal broke in May of 2013, I immediately thought back to that, and I absolutely saw an example of them chilling their conduct because they were concerned about the IRS. Yeah. Mr. Chaffetz, do you think there was deliberate intent, uh, attempt on the part of some person? Yeah, it, it does appear that in the case of, of Lois Lerner and that there was a concerted effort um, to target. That was the conclusion of the Inspector General. That was why we got this, this uh, scandal has continued to grow. I separate that from the resolution that we have before us, but the underlying premise that they targeted conservatives, suppressed their First Amendment rights? Absolutely. I, don't, I think that, that issue has been clearly documented. Well, um, <laughs> 
just to, to end in here, uh, the purpose of my questions were simply to point out that yes, intimidation did occur yeah. and government power was used to do that. And at least some of those individuals knowingly did that. And that that is counter to everything we are as a republic, that we're a rule of law, not a rule of men. And if we overlook that, just carelessly or casually, then I think we fail the test of being not only the defenders of our Constitution, but of our republic and of the people respectively. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I hope we consider that carefully and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. I now recognize myself for five minutes. I'd like to thank all of the committees that spent countless hours investigating this matter, and I'd like to particularly thank my distinguished colleagues uh, that are here as witnesses today. <clears throat> thank you for uh, being here and uh, for uh, being here in the search for the truth. Uh, if we were rewind this story all the way to the beginning, we know that uh, this began with the IRS singling out and targeting conservative groups because of their beliefs. We know that the IG has, uh, has confirmed that. And the problem here is the IRS went after and targeted select group, groups of Americans because of their political beliefs. And in this case, it was uh, conservatives. Uh, I've listened to my Democratic colleagues across the aisle today uh, talk about this hearing being an, uh, an instance of grandstanding and calling it a circus. But I wonder if some of those uh, Democratic colleagues might feel differently if the IRS had been targeting other groups like environmentalists or LGBT advo advocacy groups. You know, regardless of the type of American, um, Congress has to restore faith and trust in an agency that's doing targeting of any type of American. And we're here at the wish of the American people. Congress is investigating because of that. The committees here uh, are trying to right a wrong and to restore America's trust. And unfortunately, because Lois Lerner, the driving force behind these initial outrageous activities, because she refused to cooperate with Congress's investigations, Americans are left really with one avenue for finding the truth, for learning the truth, and that's through her email records. The problem here is when the IRS was given a second bite at the apple, another opportunity, a second opportunity to restore and rebuild that trust, um, the IRS once again broke that trust with the American people, this time through the behavior of IRS Commissioner Koskinen. Uh, the facts here are really not in dispute. The commissioner failed to comply with the subpoena. He failed to prevent the destruction of evidence, in this case, more than 24,000 of Ms. Lerner's emails. He provided false testimony to Congress on a number of occasions. His statement today said that he testified truthfully and to the best of his knowledge, but um, the fact is he didn't testify truthfully. It may have been to the best of his knowledge, um, but it was not truthful, and he failed to notify Congress when key evidence was missing. Uh, his statement offers a whole range of excuses, um, that the uh, erasure of tapes was an accident, that he personally didn't erase them. He even goes so far as to say that he never even asked to be the IRS commissioner in the first place. But all of that misses the point. Um, uh, as Harry S. Truman said, the buck stops here, it stops at the top. And once Commissioner Koskinen assumed the mantle of responsibility, he deserves to be and ought to be um, held responsible uh, for any misconduct. When any official misleads the American people and their elected representatives, when they obstruct an investigation and they allow the destruction of key evidence, action has to be taken. And it has to be taken whether or not uh, that's done intentionally or knowingly, or whether it's done just through gross negligence, whether it's through such reg reckless uh, ignorance um, that it allows the truth to be forever obfuscated from the American people. I wish that uh, Commissioner Koskin had chosen to be here today. I would have a number of questions for him. He's indicated that he may come back uh, before this committee. I hope that he does, and if he does, I'll give him an advance warning of what we'd like to know, and that is uh, I'd like to know why, despite learning in two February of 2014 that thousands of learner emails were missing, the IRS never even tried to recover the backup tapes. Was that intentional, or was it just a result of incompetence? I'd like to ask him why the IRS 
fail to look in five of the six places where the emails could have potentially been recovered again was that something that was intended to mislead or was it just plain stupidity i would ask the commissioner why he failed to notify Congress about the missing emails for several months despite a prior commitment on the record to be transparent and to notify us as soon as any problem arose. I'd asked why he falsely testified to Congress when he said, quote, since the start of this investigation, every email has been preserved. Nothing has been lost. Nothing has been destroyed. Less truthful words have likely never been spoken before this committee. I'd like to ask the commissioner why he said those words in here under oath. But unfortunately, he's not here. Despite the serious allegations leveled against him, he's declined to participate. But the American people here deserve to know why they were misled. They deserve to know that the government officials are not above the law. And that's what this hearing is about. And again, whether or not his actions were intentionally taken to deceive, or whether he was so clueless, so incompetent, so grossly negligent um, as to obfuscate the truth forever, uh, we may not know. Either way, uh, the commissioner has convinced me that he is not fit to lead an agency that has so much power and influence over the lives of every American. And that concludes our hearing today. I thank uh, our distinguished witnesses for attending. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.